you're over here. All right. Hello, everyone. So the marketing industry today is at a crossroads. The traditional approach is being challenged by new models that are utilizing a growing community of independent creatives. But will the crowd ever truly repra replace the creative industry? To debate these two approaches, we have with us two rock stars of the marketing world. One, a titan of the traditional creative agency model, and the other, a pioneer of an innovative alternative approach. The motion for this debate is the masses can replace our creative agencies. And representing the pro side, we have with us the CEO of 99designs, Patrick Llewellyn. Mr. Llewellyn was appointed to the CEO position in 2011 after overseeing the company's successful expansion into the United States. With 115 employees spread across offices in San Francisco, Melbourne, Berlin, Rio, uh, and Rio, uh, 99designs has paid out more than $200 million to its community of over over a million designers around the world. Representing the con side, we welcome Jacob Benbunan. Did I get that right? All right. The founder of Saffron Consultants. Uh, since its founding in 2001, the independent global consulting company has assisted with brand strategy, experiences, innovation, and design for some of the largest brands in the world, including Vueling, Fujitsu, A1 Telecom Australia, Siemens, and Open Bank. Thank you both, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, before we get into the debate, uh, we're going to start by gathering an initial show of hands to sort of get a sense of where everybody stands. So once again, the motion for the debate is the masses can replace our creative agencies. And now please raise your hand if you agree with the motion. All right, and raise your hand if you disagree. Okay, interesting starting point. All right, so. Our debaters will now each have five minutes for their opening statements, and we are starting with Mr. Llewellyn. Uh, Mr. Llewellyn, stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, I've got a tough crowd here. Did you see that vote? All right. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start off. I mean, I actually think this debate is actually unnecessary. If the masses couldn't take out the creative agency, then I wouldn't be standing here today, would I? Um, the reality of it is that I'm representing a thriving community of designers from all over the world um, who have earned $200 million, as Jared said, um, you know, from our humble beginnings as a startup out of Australia in 2008. So I think we've got plenty of evidence to suggest that the masses are here to stay. Um, you know, why do these peer-to-peer -peer talent networks exist? Well, it's really about three big points. It's access to talent, transparency, creativity, and efficiency of process, and then great results that customers love. So let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. You're only as good, like, so the agencies today that we deal with are only as good as the talent that resides in it at the time of the engagement. Anyone who's from the, the, the agency uh, playing field today knows just how fickle this engagement can be. No agency has a monopoly on talent. They're really only as good as the talent that resides in their four walls at that very time. And we all know that talent resides throughout the world. The reality of it is, is that young creatives care today about creating. They don't care about which agency they work for. What they really care about is, do I, does, am I creating something that I care about? And does the work really resonate with me? So there's a lot more independence of thought. So, the reality of it is, is the peer-to-peer -peer talent network tears down uh, this barrier to talent acquisition. The, the creatives on our community or in the community of these talent networks, they do the work they want when they want to do it and from wherever they are in the world. So this ability for mobility is right there and present. The work they want to do is really the salient point here. The best creativity comes from passion and resonance with the topic. And so we understand that our agencies are deliver, uh, sorry, we understand that our creatives are working on something that specifically is theirs um, and something that they are really passionate about doing it. We also understand that agent, the, the creatives on our platform also are the, the creatives that reside in the agencies all around the world because they're moonlighting on our platform because they want to be able to choose the work that resonates with them. 
No one wants to be told by account exec what to do. It's all about choice and creative freedom. The creative agency process today is very much a black box. You know, you've got one team who comes and pitches. You've got another team who does some ideating. And then there's another team that does the execution. All of these different teams create layers of complexity and inefficiency of process that really results in increase in prices and increase in time. Whereas the creative, the talent network turns this process on its head. Brief and price is agreed up front, talent is selected, and execution occurs. There's a direct engagement between the talent on the network and the customer looking for the design work. Ultimately, our customers tell us that they don't want to work with an agency, they want to work with the talent. And it's all about the talent that's working with them. All right. I think in today's world, the one thing that we're all aware of is brands are born global. And if you're not sourcing global talent to help create your brand, then how do you know if you've truly got a global brand? We understand the power of diversity and different backgrounds in the creative process. We're not interested in just getting ideas from people in tier one cities or uh, tier one towns. What we're looking for, you know, with the same backgrounds, what we're looking for is a diversity of creative ideas from a diversity of people from all over the world. So the best results really come from when a global community is creating together, solving problems amongst themselves to deliver great results. I think the sort of the great analogy here is why settle for just one room full of talent when you can have a world full of talent? The talent network provides you access to unlimited talent, a creative community that's passionate about the problem that they're solving. It gives you access to brainstorming in real time because everyone is on their platform at that time. And ultimately, this delivers amazing results. I think you know, a little bit of research that we did, that we took, looked into. In Marketing Week uh, in the last year or so, they stated that 8% of senior marketing managers were satisfied with their current creative agency. At 99designs, when we survey our customers and we survey every customer who comes through our door, 65% of them tell us that they're very satisfied with the result. And luckily for us, over 50% of our customers come through word of mouth every day. So just to close, I think I'm running close to time. Access to talent, global collaboration, the transparency of this process uh, is delivering highly satisfied clients. The masses are clearly here to stay. The creative agencies who fail to evolve will be the ones who are replaced. So we don't see the agency being replaced. I just see an evolution of the agency as it re reacts today. We'll see an agency of the future that leverages the masses to augment their talent base. And so it'll be the evolution of the agency, not the replacement. You know, and, and just to finish on another sort of data point from our perspective, you know, looking at across our customer segment, our fastest growing segment by over 60% is our agency customer base. And so you know, part of my challenge here is not only to get you to vote for me, but also to, to start to use me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Jacob, now your opening statement. Okay, first and foremost, I have to start by congratulating Patrick, because he's, he's, he's achieved quite, quite something. I mean, and it's uh, uh, not just by the sheer numbers and, and, uh, and the funding that he's raised, but also by the, most importantly, by the success that he's achieved after nine years uh, running uh, the business. Uh, the role of companies like 99designs, uh, to me, is a bit like the role of fintech for the financial services. Uh, it's a very interesting, very important player in the design world. They are sort of the 
IKEA, they help democratize design. They help everyone have access and get access to uh, design. They, I don't think they're trying to become a creative agency, because after nine years, they would have become a creative agency. I think what's really uh, interesting, or I think the big difference between what uh, 99 Designs does and what people like Saffron or many other uh, creative consultancies uh, do is has to do with a fundamental difference in what a client wants. I don't think clients engage with us for a logo, for a design, for a particular solution from a graphical point of view. I don't think clients engage with us for the what. Clients engage with us for the why. Clients engage with us in a moment of transformation in the businesses where it is fundamental that they really interact with another human being that understands what the problem is that has been there before, that has, that has advised people like them before, and that actually understands that brand is not a piece of design. Design plays a very important role in brand, but brand at the end of the day is the promise of an experience delivered. At the end of the day, if I ask you to think about your favorite brand, you inevitably might think about the shape of the logo or the colors of the logo or the actual font the logo type has been drawn up if it's not the proprietary font. But most importantly, I think, you would think on the experience this brand, this organization has promised and has delivered to you. Organizations come to creative consultancies where they want, when they need, to build an experience where design plays a role. Organizations that need or require a logo type or a piece of design might find it interesting to go to the masses or might find it interesting to actually interact with a human being that actually listens to them on a one-to-one -one basis and interacts with them on a one-to-one -one basis. I don't think there is either or. I don't think there's them or us. I am totally convinced there's room for them and us. They fulfill a particular aim, a particular need that some clients have. We fulfill, uh, dare say, a much bigger, larger need. That's. What I'd like to All right. And actually, since I began with Patrick, uh, I'm going to start with the first question with you. Um, and, and the way that you're describing it, uh, that, that sort of sit down, get to know you brand experience, there's more and more pressure on organizations, on budgets these days. And alternatives like Patrick's are becoming more popular because there's so much more pressure for results, so much uh, more pressure on uh, spreading the budget. In the future, do you imagine that this will still, the agency model will still be open to a majority of organizations, or will it continue to only be you know, the top tier brands increasingly as time goes on? Well, that's a really, really interesting uh, uh, question. The, um, uh, and, and it's precisely the same thing that is pushing the fintech industry uh, clash, clash, or really interfere with the financial services industry. Uh, bringing costs down, taking the intermediary out, actually uh, managing more for less. We, creative consultancies, brand consultancies, experience, innovation, transformation advisors, need to learn the fact that companies have, one, less time, two, less money, and three, more competition. That means that the same way 
take, take a startup or take a company that really needs to go to market very fast. The same way they have a minimal viable product that to shape and to build a proposition to the market, we have learned that because they don't have the money, because they don't have the time, and because competition is large, we have to develop an approach which we call minimal viable brand. And a minimal viable brand is a way of approaching less budgets, less time, etc., with uh, a creative approach that does not sacrifice the human relationship, the personal relationship, but actually covers both things. You don't go into as much detail as you would if you had six months to develop the work, but you actually deliver something which actually works in the time frame and in the budget that clients actually have, some clients actually have today. All right. And uh, Patrick, I, he's, he's brought up the idea of this sort of uh, evolution towards becoming a, what the fintechs are to the big banks. The big banks, it's, it's probably another debate for another day, but at this point in time, it doesn't seem like Goldman Sachs is going to be toppled any day soon. Uh, how do you react to that comparison? Yeah, I'm not sure I follow that comparison really at all. Uh, it's, I guess, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. I, it sounds like he's saying that it's more of a peripheral uh, industry that adds to the services already available by the well-established companies, but will never come to replace those well-established companies. I think we'll just see an evolution. You know, Goldman Sachs will stay on top because they will acquire the, the newest, brightest fintech as it comes through the doors. They'll take advantage of the new processes and new software as they come at come avail to us. And, and that's what we both, th I think, we believe will happen with the creative agency. The agency is not going to rely on the talent that only sits within its walls. It's going to rely on the talent that it can access from a global network like ours. I think the thing is, when we talk about minimum viable product and brand experience, I mean, I think Jacob made a fantastic point. What is important in a brand promise, it's actually all about brand delivery, right? And it doesn't matter how much an agency can tell you how to refine your message or how to present your brand. Ultimately, it's up to you as the organization, as the company, as the startup delivering that solution. It's about how you play out with your customers, how you deliver your service. And I think what we see is that startups, when they start, really don't know what their, their value proposition is really going to be. They have an idea. They have a bunch of speculation and research, and then they want to get out and test their assumptions. And we see an evolution of brands as they start to find this notion of product market fit. And I think global networks like ours, I mean, 99 Designs, we've helped 475,000 customers get brand identity done. And that's because we're fast, we're affordable, we give you the ability to ideate with individuals all over the world. I think we're, we're moving away from a society where we need to communicate one-to-one. -one. I mean, I think one-to-one -one communication means different things to different people today. You know, I know that in my office, if I want to talk to my engineers, I'm using Slack, right? I'm not actually communicating directly to them. And so that sort of rich, immersive chat experience happens every day between designers and customers from all over the world. And they foster really strong, deep relationships that they take forward, right? And so the designer that you've met on 99designs will stick with you and evolve with you with your brand and continue to provide you advice and your graphic assets as you move through. So I think really the important thing to do as a startup is get out, start to test your business, start to test what your value proposition is, and from there you can start to refine your brand. I mean, I think this notion of minimal viable, I mean, I think I've got a very different understanding of what that means as a bootstrap startup. Uh, versus perhaps a, a funded startup. And so I think that, you, you know, like, I just see that evolution uh, occurring. My, 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 reaction to, if I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. my reaction to that would be how you define, what is, uh, what is a brand? And if a brand is a logotype with a bunch of colors and a font and an uh, imagery, uh, that's a whole world, a whole set of, uh, elements that define the brand, and the brand is the promise of an experience that actually includes design as uh, one of the elements that define it. It's another totally different archetype of what brand needs. The big issue here uh, has, I mean, the, the big danger here is that we fall into semantics, is how do we, or what do we define as a brand? I, my view is that brand is not a, uh, 
symbol, a logotype, and some colors. This is just the uh, one of the elements that shape your brand. And your brand, at the end of the day, is how you define the experience. And this is where comes elements like user experience, elements like physical retail experience, elements like messaging framework, elements like um, employee value proposition, elements like what is the culture of a business. And this, in my opinion, cannot be serviced electronically. It has and requires the human touch. Yeah, um, and I think we agree. I just think the human touch can come from anyone in the world yeah. Right, via a platform. A human touch doesn't mean we have to be sitting in the same room together to make that connection. And the brand experience is a wholly rest on the organization that's delivering it, not on the person who creates the logo type or gives advice on what the brand experience should be. It's all about how does the company fulfill its promise to its customers? What is the service what, that they're offering? And how does that really deliver value? And I think that ultimately is the brand promise. And that's not beholden on a design you get from 99designs or the advice you get from Saffron. It's actually, what does the organization really believe? And how are they able to deliver on that to each and every customer they interact with? Uh, let me just get one last question in here before we got to wrap up. Um, so, Jacob, Patrick has mentioned uh, the 75,000 uh, brands that he's... That, uh, 475. Sorry? 475. Oh, wow, that's 000. way more impressive. Half All a right. million. <laughs> 475,000. Um, and the fact that a lot of these designers are growing along with the brand and helping them develop over time. Do you think that this is a temporary reaction to the current ecosystem, or do you think that this is a new normal? Let me, just, let me just answer with, um, I was in Sao Paulo, we have an office in Sao Paulo, and I was in Sao Paulo about three months ago, and I had dinner with a, a surgeon, and we were talking about artificial intelligence. And he told me that he was very concerned and really wanted to have a conversation with me one-to-one -one because he was concerned that his job was at stance because of technology. And he said that one day he will be redundant. And if you had... He was a cancer, he was an oncologist. And if you had cancer, you would eventually do not need an oncologist to help you. And my reaction was uh, uh, of uh, surprise, because um, uh, there's, uh, yes, you understand and you agree that when you have a heart attack or when you have uh, um, the flu, uh, the med medicine with capital letters have developed a protocol to address a heart attack, to address a flu, or even to address the initial stages of a cancer. You know that if you have a cancer, there's chemotherapy, there's radiotherapy, then now there's talks about immunotherapy, and, and there's a very specific protocol. And his point is, well, if there's a very specific protocol, a machine can do it. A machine that is intelligent enough, enough to really do it, a machine can do it. And I said, but there's a fundamental difference here. The fundamental difference is that the machine cannot sense your feelings. The machine cannot really feel your pain, cannot look into your eyes. Fine, one day, maybe, when Kubrick becomes reality and Hal actually understands our feelings, maybe they will know. But for the time being, and I hope it will be for a very long time, a machine will not see and understand how why and what is happening inside me. He was somewhat comforted by my um, view. My view is that, I mean, without, with, with the, the enormous differences that there are between being an oncologist and whether an oncologist will be replaced by a machine eventually, or whether Frank Gehry will eventually be replaced by a machine, or whether you will be able to build the Guggenheim in Bilbao via the masses, my view is that the Guggenheim in Bilbao will only, could only, and has only been built by the genius of a man that happens to be Frank Gehry, or Gaudí, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, or what have you. My view is that, yes, you don't have to be Charles and Ray Eames, you don't have to go to Charles and Ray Eames to have a lovely lounge chair. You can go to Ikea and get one, instead of $6,000, you get one for 
$150. That's perfectly fine. And there's people that can live with a $150 chair, and people that love to have a 6000 and can afford a $6,000 chair designed by Charles and Ray Ames. I think there is room for everyone, and there's room for the success of people like 99 Designs and the success for people like Saffron. And that's my sort of uh, view as we wish then. All right, and uh, I'm going to give you the uh, last word here to close us off if you have anything you want to respond to in particular. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Jacob is making my point for me, which is <laughs> great. humans are the center of the universe. We believe in the power of human-centered design. We believe in design thinking. Do I believe networks can do it better? I think so, right? I think we can actually take artificial uh, intelligence, machine learning to apply it to a range of data so that we can make the experience so much better. The fact is we're moving into an integrated world where the integration of different services and, and the creation of different products will become a lot more seamless and, and sort of one click, if you like. And so it is going to be really important, the role of the human in this experience, as it's supported by an intelligent network. But those humans, I just fundamentally believe, can be any one of us in this room or any one of us in this globe. And I don't need to rely on an agency in Barcelona with a $6,000 chair. I'm actually quite happy to source my talent from either the, the new upstart designer in New Delhi, or perhaps it's the retired senior art director in Ottawa. I want that talent to shine through. I want to get access to that talent wherever it may be in the world. No longer should borders be breaking us down, right? We should just have access to the talent wherever they are. And it's peer-to-peer -peer networks that are going to provide us with that access, break down these barriers, and ultimately just deliver great results for everyone. The agency will play its part. For those who can afford that experience, they will. The agencies will evolve and take the best attributes of what a peer-to-peer -peer network can bring to them and use them to their advantage. Both of us are going to continue to exist. I just think that the, the masses are going to play a very important role in the evolution of how we engage with each other and the world is ultimately getting a whole lot closer. All right, well, to finish this off, we're going to take a poll one last time to see if opinion has changed in any significant way uh, over the last half hour. So once again, the motion for the debate is the masses can replace our creative agencies. Please raise your hand if you agree. And please raise your hand if you disagree. <laughs> Still the same. I think that's uh, fairly decisive. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen, both. <laughs> Thanks, guys.